Hi class, I'm so sorry I can't be with you live today. I'm pre-recording this lecture coming from Portland, Oregon, where I'm uh, taking care of my son who's, who's in the hospital. He's okay, um, but um, I'm not sure what's gonna be happening on Tuesday, so I thought it best to just pre-record things and have you watch it on your own time. Um, I'm gonna try to be making my office hours um, but I'll just keep you all posted because uh, everything's kind of up in the air for me right now. Um, okay, so let's get started. I'm really excited about today's lecture actually because we're going to be talking about the Laplace Beltrami operator. And um, I'll be honest, and I didn't know a whole lot about this before this course. And it's a central object of differential geometry, especially discrete differential geometry and geometry processing and, um, and computer graphics from everything I've learned. I've spent actually a good chunk of this semester just learning about this in preparation for what we're going to talk about today. This lecture is really, really different than Keenan's treatment of the material. Um, there's some overlap. There's a lot of overlap, obviously. But um, Keenan takes a different approach in his video on this he really he's trying to give you a grand overview and give you some intuition about what the Laplacian is and um, he gives you like 10 different different definitions of the Laplacian it's really worth watching his video he has amazing animations he's an excellent speaker so for class on Tuesday I, I'm sorry excuse me for class on Thursday I think all we're going to have you do is watch his version of this but um, one of the things I don't like personally about the way he does things is, is since he's giving you this grand overview, he only spends about five minutes on each way to uh, define the Laplacian. And some of them are very advanced. And I don't, I'm not sure you walk away with a really deep understanding of any one way. So, so rather than doing that things his way, I think it'd be more useful for you guys if we just took a deep dive into one or two ways to define the Laplacian. We're going to look at two equivalent ways to define the Laplacian today. Um, one coming directly from vector calculus, really basic vector calculus, and then we're going to look at how to discretize that using discrete exterior calculus that we spent the whole first half of the semester on. So I think it's a really nice um, to, to go back to that material. And, and kind of justifies all the work we did on that discrete exterior calculus material. And that'll let us discretize things on surfaces and then you'll see how to do the coding homework and um, I think you'll have all the tools you'll need to do the Laplace homework this week. Okay, so I encourage you to again watch his video on Thursday and also to read this section of the textbook and um, uh, it's got some useful things in there which will also help you do the homework assignment as well. All right, so let's see, let's get started. Let me share my iPad screen here for a second. Um, a minute here, share. And hopefully you're seeing my iPad screen now. Yes, perfect, okay, great. All right, so let's get started now. Um, Second here, I'm not really sure what you're seeing where I am and, and what you're seeing right now in this recording, but let's get started. So this is the Laplace Beltrami operator. Um, I tried to keep these slides with a consistent feel, with a feel that kind of feels like Keenan's slide. So I use the same kind of background color. Um, I did write all these slides from scratch. So um, please forgive me if there's uh, things that you don't understand or if the slides are or or organized in a, in a different way than you're used to at this point. I borrowed a lot of his figures, but I also created a lot of these figures myself as well. Um, so you'll see kind of a mix of, of his figures in, in a different style of figure as well. Let, let, let's get started. Um, Laplacian is a pretty basic thing to define. It's just the divergence of the gradient. So um, we start with a just a regular function here. This could be a function of two variables, three variables, function of x, y, z. Um, and then you take the divergence, and if you remember what the, um, sorry, we take the gradient, this first noblet represents the gradient, and that gives you a vector field, and I'll remind you what that looks like in a minute. Now, if you take the curl of that vector field, the curl of the gradient would give you zero. 
that's one of the basic theorems of vector calculus. But um, one of the things you don't talk much about in vector calculus is that you can also take the divergence of that vector field. So um, this is a function. And then the gradient of that gives you a vector field. But then the divergence of a vector field gives you back a function. Okay. So when you put all that together, you start with a function f. And the Laplacian, this, this right side up triangle is the Laplacian, is another function. So you get one function from an original function. And there's no, the vector fields are only intermediate stages. Um, so, so function goes in, function comes out. So just let's just remind you what each of these things look like. The gradient is always a vector field. And the only thing you need to really remember about the gradient is that it's a vector field that always points uphill. So what we're seeing here is the graph of a function z equals f of x comma y. So this is, this is the graph of that function, okay? And then the gradient of that function um, is just in the xy plane. So that's slightly different. The graph of the function lives in three dimensions. So it's a function of two variables. The graph of that function lives in three dimensions, whereas the gradient of that function is a vector field in two dimensions. That's down here. Here's the gradient of f. And um, the only things you need to remember is that the gradient of f always points in the uphill direction, meaning um, that if I am at a point x0, comma y0, okay, and then I were to lift that point up to the plane, and I wanted to know what cardinal direction, north, south, east, or west, would I travel to go uphill? Well, I'd have to go in the direction, in this direction, in three dimensions. But on my map, I'd be going, sorry, in, in this direction. Um, I didn't do that very well. But I hope you get the idea, OK? So gradient points uphill. And the thing to, one of the things to take away from that is that at a minimum here, that's a place where all the vectors point away from that. And at a maximum over here, that's a place where the gradient is um, gives you a sink. So sinks correspond to maxima, and sources of that vector field correspond to minima. All right, now remember, the Laplacian is the divergence of the gradient, OK? So let's just think about divergence. If you just have any vector field at all, and you see a source, a place where there's a point, and everything is radiating away from that point, that's a place where, um, so here's my vector field V. So the divergence of V is positive near sources. And if we have everything going towards some point, that's a sink. And that would be a place where the divergence of V is negative, okay? So sources in a vector field correspond to a positive gradient and sinks in a vector field correspond to negative gradient, okay? So let's you now um, combine that with this, okay? So the gradient of a function gives you a vector field that has a source near minima and a sink near maxima. And the divergence of a vector field is positive near the sources and negative near the sinks. So the divergence of the gradient um, gives you positive things near the minima of your function. Right? Near the minima of a function, you have a source in the vector field, which means the divergence is positive. And near the maxima of your function, you have a, a sink in your vector field, which means you have a negative divergence. So the Laplacian is positive near the minima and negative near the maxima. Okay, so where the function is big, the Laplacian is negative, And where the function is small, the Laplacian is positive. Okay, Just keep that in mind. It's the kind of key to understanding the Laplacian. All right, well, that means, you know, again, if you have a maxima, you have a negative Laplacian, and a minima, you have a positive Laplacian. So if the Laplacian is zero, you don't have any places where it's positive, any places where it's negative. That means you don't have any maxima or any minima. So um, this is, these are some pictures of what it looks like when the Laplacian is zero, okay? Zero Laplacian means no maxima, no minima. It doesn't mean that the function can't have a maximum on its boundary. 
just means in the interior of the domain of definition of the function, you can't see maxima or minima. Um, but nothing rules out those maxima or minima occurring on the boundary. Of course, you have in the picture like this, you have lots of maxima here and lots of minima down here. Okay. Um, equations, this equation, this particular equation where the Laplacian equals zero is called Laplace's equation, and solutions to that equation are called harmonic functions. So if you ever hear the term harmonic function, that's just a place where the Laplacian is zero. And we'll see that later the Laplacian has a lot to do with the second derivative. In fact, all the Laplace, one way to define the Laplacian that I think is less intuitive um, is it's a place where the, it, the, the Laplacian is the sum of the second derivatives. So if you have a harmonic function, it means the sum of the second derivatives is zero. It's another definition for harmonic functions. It's a lot, a lot nicer though to just say that, um, that the Laplacian in F is zero. Um, one of the things you'll notice here is that if you have a harmonic function, then it might be zero on the boundary, but it might also not be zero on the boundary. And the boundary might go, might go up and down and up and down. So you might ask, well, what if I know what the boundary is? Do, is it possible to find a harmonic function that always interpolates from a given set of boundary conditions? And the answer is yes, actually, which is kind of amazing, is that if you have any function that's just defined on the boundary of the domain, wiggles as much as you want, then you can fill in that function um, with something where the Laplacian is zero. You can always extend the function defined on the boundary to a harmonic function on the interior. And you can think of that as just maybe taking a sheet of rubber and attaching it to the boundary curve, and then it, you fill it in as tightly as possible because it's kind of stretched over the boundary, so you don't create any local maxima or local minima in the interior, and that gives you a harmonic function. Um, on a closed surface, if you have a harmonic function, then, you know, so closed surface is a surface like a sphere that has no boundary, and on surfaces like that, you don't, since you don't have maxima and you don't have minima, then all harmonic functions have to be constant. So you need to work out the details of that for yourself. It's a couple of sentences of, of just thinking it through, and it's one of the homework assignments actually, is to show that on a closed surface, the harmonic functions are always constant. Um, it is more interesting on a closed surface to think about situations where the Laplacian is zero almost everywhere, but you fixed certain values, certain non-zero places. So for example, in this picture, we fixed places where we want the Laplacian to be negative one and other places where we want the Laplacian to be positive one. And we'll say everywhere else, we want the Laplacian to be zero. Okay, so this function G is telling us where we want the Laplacian to be zero and where we don't. And what, so we're looking for solutions to the Laplacian equals G. And you see, you get this nice picture here on the right, on the far right there, where somehow functions that satisfy that equation smoothly interpolate in as nice of a way as possible from the negative one stuff to the positive one stuff. Here where it's all patchy, the, you don't have the right solution, where you have this nice smooth interpolation from one value to the other, that's a solution to this equation. This equation is called Poisson's equation. So it's a lot like Laplace's equation. Laplace's equation, we had um, the Laplacian equals zero, and Poisson's equation, we have the Laplacian equals some other function that's not necessarily zero. It has places where you have positive values, places where you have negative values, and any place that acts like where you have a positive value, it's the coloring here of blue and red um, is supposed to indicate temperature to you. And that's because Poisson's equation is modeling um, steady state temperature flow. So if you have a, a heat source, those are places where G is one, that's a hot area of this bunny, and where G is negative one, that's supposed to represent a really cold area, and we're gonna keep those temperatures fixed at those two points, and then ask for the steady state solution. In other words, we let the temperature kind of flow from the hot to the cold, and wait till the temperature sort of settles down, always keeping the tail hot and the ears cold, and the steady state solution there for the um, temperature is exactly what you get as the solutions to Poisson's equation. 
Now, I said something a second ago. I said, we look at the steady state solution. We look at the solution where we've waited for a while and the temperature over the whole bunny has kind of stabilized. But we could think about one step back. What if we just suddenly apply a heat source to the tail and a cold source to the ears and then watch the temperature kind of flow from cold to hot? So in that case, we have a time element. So the temperature now of the whole bunny is changing before we settle down on a temperature distribution. So we're gonna add this extra variable to model this situation um, of time. So instead of now the function we're taking the Laplacian of just being a function of spatial coordinates like X and Y, now we're gonna add this extra variable T and we're gonna look at this partial differential equation where the partial derivative of f with respect to t is exactly the Laplacian, and that Laplacian is taken over the spatial coordinates. As I said, one way to define the Laplacian is the sum of the second derivatives. So here we're just talking about the sum of the second derivatives of the spatial coordinates. So partial squared f, partial x squared, plus partial squared f, partial y squared. We'll, we'll see that a little more later, okay? And on the left side, we're looking at the partial with respect to t. So this is a little bit hard to understand what this even means, what solutions look like. So to, to help you understand that, I think it actually helps to discretize it. Um, so remember, the derivative is just a continuous version of this approximation. It's just This is just from Calc 1, where you want to write down the derivative. So you take the value of the function after time epsilon subtract the original value of the function and then divide by epsilon, right? This is f of x plus h minus f of x over h. That's what should be just drilled into your head from calc one, okay? And epsilon is some tiny, tiny increment of time here. And we're saying that the Laplacian of f at time t, that's why now there's a subscript of t, is given by this kind of discretized version. We can solve this equation for f sub t plus epsilon for the value of f at time t plus epsilon. All I did here is multiply both sides by epsilon and then add f t to the other side. And what this is saying is that the value of f at some small amount of time in the future, right, that's f of t plus epsilon, the value of f at small, small amount of time in the future, is exactly, I get that by taking the present value of f and adding to that a very, very small multiple of the Laplacian. Okay, so that's really what, what, what's happening with this equation here on top is f is moving forward in time by taking its present value and moving it in the direction of the Laplacian. So let's think about what that means. Remember, now we're going to go back to what we said earlier. The Laplacian is negative near the maxima and positive near the minima. So if I take my original function, right, it's got a maximum. Now I add to it a little tiny bit of the Laplacian. So at the maximum, the Laplacian is negative, which is gonna to move to bump down that maximum. And at the minima, the Laplacian is positive. So if I add the Laplacian, it increases the minima, right? So over time, we'll see the minima increase and the maxima decrease, which is gonna kind of flatten out the function. And that's exactly what we want. The Laplacian um, as a function of time, if we look at this, um, time evolving version of the Laplacian, it um, smooths out the function, decreases the, the maximal bumps and, and, sorry, yes, and increases the minima. <laughs> Again, this is also modeling heat flow in a, in a dynamic way. So now we have, we heat up some, they have this flat plate, we heat up some regions of the plate and we cool down some other region of the plate. And now we just let time go and we watch the temperature flow from the hot areas to the cold areas, and um, eventually it'll all kind of even out. And that's exactly what this differential equation, this partial differential equation is modeling, which is why it's called the heat equation. I think it was due to Laplace, and it's also called Laplace's heat equation. All right, so that, I'm hoping that gives you some idea, some intuition for what the Laplacian is. So the Laplacian is, you can think of it as this operator that you can use to smooth out a function, right? And that's exactly, if you wanna think about um, looking forward to these applications we're gonna to have to discrete differential geometry. Uh, imagine you have a bumpy surface and you wanna make that surface smooth. Well, you can decrease or increase the bumps by adding small amounts of the Laplacian to it. So we're gonna see that by the end of the lecture.
Okay, but you can also have any function, any sort of distribution you want on the surface. Um, let's say you want uh, to model a, a hairy animal because you work for Pixar and you're creating some sort of hairy thing. You know, you could think about the hairs laying flat on one part of the surface and standing up on another part, and you want to somehow model what would happen as the hairs knock over going from one side to the other as the wind blows or anything. You can imagine, you can use the Laplacian to interpolate across the surface however you want. All right, so before we get into all that, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here, let's look at um, just the vector calculus definition in terms of coordinates now, okay? So um, the gradient, remember the Laplacian is the divergence of the gradient. So let's take this slow. So the gradient you get, that's the vector field you get by just looking at the components, which are the partial derivatives of f with respect to each variable, okay? And then the divergence, well, the divergence of any vector field, which mean, means I take the first coordinate and I take its partial with respect to x. And then the second coordinate, I take its partial with respect to y. The third coordinate is partial with respect to z. And I add all those. So that's the divergence of the gradient. I put all that together, and I just have the sum of the second derivatives of f. And so that's the divergence of the gradient. It's exactly what I said before. So another way to think about the Laplacian on flat, on, on functions defined on Rn is it's the sum of the second derivatives. That's not the best way to think of it. It's much better to think of it just in terms of the divergence of the gradient. Um, that's a little bit more general and we'll see because that is going to lead us to something that um, will generalize to curved surfaces more. This idea of it being the sum of the second derivatives is not so useful for curved surfaces. So in, to move up to curved surfaces, we're going to look at an equivalent definition of the Laplacian. This is a completely different way to define the Laplacian. And on our end, we'll see it's exactly equivalent. So this is, we've got to go all the way back to like lecture one or lecture two, when we started doing differential forms. And then we're going to discretize that. We're going to go up to discrete differential forms. And we're, so we're just kind of reviewing here everything we did in the first half of the semester. So if you remember how to just take a zero form, which is just a function, and make and write its derivative, that's a one form. You just take its partials, dx, dy, dz. Right? So if f, for example, is x, y squared plus z, then df, well, I would take the partial with respect to x, that'd be y squared, dx. The partial with respect to y is 2xy, dy. Partial respect to z is just one dz. So that's how you would do the derivative of that zero form is giving you a one form. Right now the Hodge star is just acting on the dx, the dy, and the dz. So the Hodge star of dx is dy wedge dz. The Hodge star of dy is dz wedge dx, but I can write it as dx wedge dz if I negate it. Right? And then the Hodge star of dz is dx wedge dy again. Now we're going to take the derivative of that. So now you've got to remember how to differentiate a two form. Well, the derivative of this, I'm sorry, I'm getting a call. I'm going to decline that. The derivative of this two form, um, well, where you have dy wedge dz, you take the partial with respect to x. And where you have dx wedge dz, you take the partial with respect to y, and where you have dx wedge dy, you take the partial with respect to z. I'm going to pause this just for a second. Okay, I'm back here. Um, so I had to pause that for a bit. All right, where were we? Uh, we took the derivative, and now we have, so now we have a three form. So d, so the derivative of the Hodge star of the derivative of f is now a three form. Okay, now each of those terms, dy wedge dz wedge dx, I can rearrange and make it dx wedge dy wedge dz as long as I pay attention to the signs. When I rearrange that first term, it stays positive. I actually have to do two flips to make it dx wedge dy wedge dz. That keeps it positive. I only have to do one flip here with this term, just flip the dz and the dy. Um, and here I don't have to do any flips at all. So you end up with just swapping, turning that negative into a positive. And when you add things, you can then factor out the dx wedge dy wedge dz. And what you're left with is the sum of the second partials 
times dx wedge dy wedge dz, right? So that's a three form now. And then the Hodge star of that three form is just that coefficient function, which is the sum of the second partials. Okay, so it's, it's pretty cool. It really relates back to the stuff we did before. So going back a second ago, um, we've got the um, divergence of the gradient is just the sum of the second partials. And now we're saying star d star df is also the sum of the second partials, which means star d star df is the same thing as the divergence of the gradient. So that's an alternate definition of the Laplacian. Now the nice thing about thinking of the Laplacian as star d star df is that we know how to define the Hodge star and the d operator on surfaces, on smooth surfaces, and we know how to discretize those on meshes. So we've, now the work's kind of done for us. So what we want to do now is go through the discretization. And not only do you know we know that, but then later in the class, really kind of reviewing everything we did in this class, later in the class, um, we looked at the star operator and the D operator, not just to find on R valued forms, but on R three valued forms. And very little changed actually. The only thing you had to remember was the wedge product turned into a cross product. And that's really it. Um, and even that won't come up very much in a minute, okay? So we're gonna assume that F now, the function F is now an R3 valued zero form, which is just the parameterization for the surface. All it is, is just F is just giving us the coordinates of every point of our triangulated mesh, okay? So that's what F is. It's just, it's, it's considered an R3 valued zero form Remember, a zero form, a discrete zero form, is something only defined at the vertices of our mesh. And it's a function that maps each vertex to its three-dimensional coordinates. It's the R3 valued zero form, right? So vertex I has coordinates one comma one comma zero. That's the value of the zero form F evaluated on vertex I, right? And same thing for vertex J. So here's just some examples here of what this might be, okay? So that's a zero form. The derivative of a zero form, a discrete, now we're, now we're in the discrete world, right? So it's the way you dis differentiate a discrete zero form is by defining a one form. And now that one form is defined on the one simplices. And the way you define it is by evaluating it on the boundary zero simplices and subtracting. That's all it is, right? So the derivative is a one form defined on the edge, which is just the difference between fi and fj. But now if I subtract fi from fj, I get this vector eij that points along edge ij. I get this vector um, fi minus fj, and I'm probably going to get this wrong. Um, it points that way, eij. It's just that vector. Did I get it wrong? You'll tell me afterwards. <clears throat> All right, now we want to do the Hodge star of that one form. So now the Hodge star gives me a dual one form on a dual edge. Remember the dual edge is the edge that connects two circumcenters of each of those two simplices, okay? So this is also a one form on the dual edge. And the way you get that one form from the previous one form is by multiplying by the ratios of the lengths. Remember, you have to multiply by the length of the dual cell divided by the length of the original cell. Okay, the original, original cell was, is right here in the denominator, but now we also have this factor, which is the length of that dual cell. Right, so Eij star, that's what this is. This is Eij star is that gray edge, okay? But um, this is something we looked at earlier in the class a couple of weeks ago, the ratio between the length of the dual edge and the length of the primal edge is exactly expressed by this cotan formula. This cotan formula is popping up here. So another way to say that, um, just going back for a second, this, switch colors here, this ratio is exactly this, formula right here, the one half, the cotan of alpha plus the cotan of beta, 
gives you that ratio, okay? So that's where we're getting the cotan formula now popping up into the discrete Laplace, just at the star DF level, right? So again, F is giving us the coordinates of the vertices, DF gives you the edges, and then star DF is giving you a one form on the dual edges that's related to the one form on the original edges by this, these cotan, the sum of these two cotans. But now we're not going. Now we have to take the derivative of that. Okay, now the derivative of a dual one form is a dual two form. That's going to map a dual two simplex, which is this light gray thing here, to some vector in R3. Right? These are R3 valued forms. So a dual R3 valued two form takes a dual two simplex, like this gray thing, and maps it to a vector in R3. Okay? And those words sound much more complicated than what it actually is. What it actually is, is I take, um, going back, I take the, the sum of the cotans corresponding to this edge, and then the sum of the cotans corresponding to this edge, and the sum of the cotans corresponding to this edge, right? So I'm doing the cotan of this angle plus the cotan of that angle, and then the cotan of this angle plus the cotan of that angle, and then the cotan of this angle plus the cotan of that angle. And I'm just adding up the value of this one form on each of the edges of this dual cell, and that's how I get the value. So the only thing that's changed is now I'm doing a summation. That's it. Okay, so if you compare the previous slide to this slide, now I'm gonna add this up over all the edges of the dual two cell to get the value for the whole dual two cell. Right, now we're gonna go one more step forward. Now we have to take the Hodge star of that, and to get the Hodge star of that, I'm back to a primal zero form. So that's just a number defined on the vertices again. So we started with something defined on the vertices, which was the coordinates of that vertex. And we're gonna end up with something defined in the vertices. It's an R3 valued form defined in the vertices, which means it's another triple of numbers defined on each original vertex. And the way you get that is by taking our previous answer and dividing it by one over the dual area, okay? So that's it. So again, the Laplacian is star D star DF, which we just said was one over the dual area, times the cotan formula. Now, this bit right in here, just this piece of it, was exactly what we found in the last two lectures when we were looking at discrete curvature. Okay, we really we're really using everything we did the whole semester here. Okay, and so we can replace that with. HNDA. If you look at that big flow chart we had that we spent the last three class days talking about, that um, expression one half times the sum of the cotans times EIJ was exactly um, our model for H, our discrete version of H, which is the mean curvature, times N, which was the normal vector, times DA. Now DA was supposed to be our um, discretized version of a little area element centered at vertex i. But th that little area element, dA, oops, going back, oh, going back, that dA, that's exactly the area of c sub i. That's what dA was, which means they cancel now, and I get just hn. Okay, and what we've proved in the discrete setting is a really well-known formula in the continuous setting. Okay, we didn't look at the proof of this in the continuous setting, but in the discrete setting, we get exactly this formula that the Laplacian is just the mean curvature times the normal vector. I think there's a factor of two missing in here, but I'm not gonna worry about that right now. All right, so let's think about what all that means. Let's put everything together that we've talked about. Now let's remember um, from the heat equation that if we use the Laplacian to flow the surface, it'll knock down the maxima and bump up the minima. So it really is, is effectively smoothing out the surface. So all that's saying 
is um, if I want to smooth my surface, I move it in the direction of the Laplacian, but the Laplacian is, direction is exactly the mean curvature normal. So it, to smooth out a surface as if it were um, a hot thing that I'm trying to make to cool down, then I use the mean curvature flow, which if the last class day I was with you was last Tuesday. Last Tuesday, I went through a lecture on discrete, you know, the last of the three discrete curvature lectures. And then I flipped over to Keenan's lecture where he had these beautiful animations of the mean curvature flow. Um, so if you remember how that worked, we are increasing f, we are looking at f a little time increment in the future by taking its present value, adding to it a little bit of the Laplacian. But the Laplacian now we just discovered was just the mean curvature times n, um, which is given in that itself. You can compute by doing the cotan formula. So you're actually going to do this in your homework. You've already, um, in your previous homework assignment, you coded up this cotan formula and you coded up the mean curvature normal. And now we're just gonna add that to the vertices of the surface to create the mean curvature flow. And here's a nice image of that from Keenan's last lecture. So we start with an original mesh and then you imagine the mean curvature normal vectors at every point of the mesh. And what you end up with, that mesh kind of puffed out a little. And what that does is it smooths out some, a lot of the points, a lot of the peculiarities of the mesh. The original mesh here looked nice, and this, the new mesh in this case looks kind of fat. Um, but in a lot of applications, like for example, if you're doing some 3D scanning, you get um, a lot of artifacts from the 3D scanner. You get all these little tiny bumps that weren't there in the original surface, and it really helps to smooth it out a little bit, and that often Doing a little bit of smoothing will often you'll often replicate the original thing you've scanned a lot better. Okay, that's the end of this lecture. So what I encourage you to do at this point is to oops, is to watch Keenan's lecture on this. I'm going to post links on the Piazza page to both these slides that you just watched this lecture that you're watching right now, um, and then Keenan's lecture. I'm talking right now on Sunday, but you're watching this probably on Tuesday. On Tuesday, I believe Keenan's gonna do a second lecture on the discrete version. Well, he'll probably say a lot of the stuff that I just said about discretizing things. And hopefully I didn't say anything that's wrong, but um, we'll all watch his lecture and find out. So, your homework is going to be due next Tuesday. That's what I've suggested to Catherine. So this is tentative now until she and I agree on this. Um, and so you should now have all the tools you need to do that homework assignment. All right. So um, I will hopefully be available for my office hours and through Zoom. So just email me if there are questions. I'm sorry if I'm not being terribly responsive while I'm here dealing with family stuff. Um, but hopefully uh, you'll get the help you need if you need it. All right. Bye, all.